recently retired as the chairman of Sprott <coughs> Holdings. He now runs uh, an organization called Rural Investment Media to educate and help investors become successful. Uh, 16 years back, um, 16, 17 years back, because a few speakers had gone missing at what was known as Agora Symposium, uh, Rick uh, gave a series of his speeches during one day. That perhaps was the most educational day of my investment career. Hopefully, his uh, symposium, which he moved to Florida this year, will move back to Vancouver next year, uh, because I do get um, some audience from his uh, symposium. Uh, he has made a name for himself for his outstanding record as one of the most successful money managers in the natural resource sector. He's passionate about helping young people succeed and guides them on how to grow their wealth. Um, Rick's, Rick is going to talk about eat the rich, prepare to starve. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Rick Rowe. Thank you for that kind introduction, Jayant, and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, normally I don't require a mic, but I wanted to make sure that <clears throat> you could all hear me. I, uh, I want to say here, as I said probably a decade ago at uh, one of my early capitalism and morality uh, conferences, there has been a uh, really an outstanding high sort of intellectual tone here with the prior speakers, and uh, sadly that's over. Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll find me somewhat more pragmatic than intellectual. Um, I, after the last talk, thought maybe I could rebrand my talk. Uh, I hope Tinkerbell gets rich, but if she does, please don't eat her. In addition, I don't want this speech to come across uh, in a way that suggests that the rich are necessarily virtuous. Uh, after all, uh, Soros, Putin, Biden, Trudeau, Trump, all those folks are rich. And I'm not gonna begin to suggest that to be rich is virtuous, but I am gonna suggest in some senses, to paraphrase uh, Dong Xiaoping, that in some aspects to be rich is glorious. Very, very different thing. I also uh, want right now, before we do any other thing else, and I'd like you all to help me, uh, putting on a conference like this is analogous to herding cats. It's a very tough thing to do. If you think it's a good way to make money, you're crazy. Giant, at least doing this, will never get rich. So I would encourage you all right now to uh, show of hands for Giant, Chen, Josh, and thank you. The uh, t title of the speech, of course, comes from the sort of, I don't know, radical leftist thing about eating the rich. And there's a whole bunch of problems with that. First of all, normally uh, rich people are old. And uh, aged beef, at least if it age, ages on the hoof, is not good beef. You know, you would prefer to eat a calf rather than someone like me. Uh, for, fair, for fairly good reasons. But uh, the idea for the talk really came uh, from Doug Casey, who has spoken here often. And what Doug said is when you view social attitudes towards you, if you become materially successful, it's aggravating to be regarded as a milk cow. But there's a very different relationship when society comes to regard you as beef. Uh, there's a level of commitment, <laughs> there's a level of victimhood, if you will, between being regarded as a milk cow, which is mildly unpleasant, and being regarded as beef, uh, which is in fact dangerous, and we'll get to that later. Following on the food metaphor, I would suggest, and I will in the course of my talk, that what the rich are in many senses is society's seed corn. Uh, and to the extent that you eat your seed corn, uh, the years that follow are substantially less pleasant than the years that went ahead. 
So let's get on with it. The first part that I'd like to make, or I'd like to actually, before I get to the first part, what I'd like to suggest to you is in the context uh, of this discussion and in the context of many political discussions that you'll hear, I want you to think about and remember a little ditty that goes like this, and it's really about savings. When your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. Because my argument is going to be that one of the social functions of the rich is to, f to, is to function as society's saving mechanism. I realize it would be better if all members of society save for themselves. My experience with regards to that uh, makes me doubt that that outcome uh, is practical. I'm going to argue, too, that in many senses, at least with regards to material well-being, that wealth is evidence of contribution. I'm going to argue that wealth is the excess of, and Walter's going to uh, criticize my semantics, my economic semantics, but I'm going to suggest that wealth uh, is really the delta between utility created and utility consumed. People who create material wealth are people who develop a product or a service that, for the most part, other people voluntarily pay for and consume. Ergo, to the extent that somebody generates uh, a lot of material wealth, that person has almost by definition created a lot of benefit for others. You may or may not like Bill Gates and what he does with his money, but no one can argue that Bill Gates was ever able to force anybody to buy a Microsoft product, whether or not you like the product. And so my argument would be, in the first instance, that Bill Gates' contribution to society, at least before he became politically active, uh, had to do with the fact that he presided over an enterprise that delivered in the eyes of its consumers amazing amounts of value. And they did it while consuming very little value themselves. The delta between the value that they created and the value that they consumed is what you would call wealth. So I would argue, I would argue that in many instances, certainly all, not all instances, I'm not suggesting as an example that uh, this generation of Trudeau has created an awful lot of value. Uh, but I am going to say with regards to created wealth that, that that wealth itself is is a demonstration of contribution to society. I'm going to suggest something else too, uh, which is that we are in a society, uh, perhaps because we've generated such amazing surpluses of wealth, uh, where savings uh, aren't regarded as being necessary for the future. Uh, and, and I would argue that that attitude is born primarily of the surpluses generated by capitalism. The truth is that a circumstance uh, becomes uh, untenable in an economic sense only very slowly, uh, and that the system that we enjoy today is partially a, a function of the incredible material surpluses that have been generated as a consequence of capitalism and the confidence that comes about as a consequence of that. When I look at the utility generation that occurs in private enterprise rather than the utility consumption that takes place as a consequence of government, uh, and I look at the faith that society has in both systems, I wonder uh, a lot, and I leave it for you to wonder too, uh, about the confidence we have in the system. The statistics are everywhere. In my country, the United States, uh, the gross federal debt, pardon me, Gross federal debt. It is, it is gross. The on balance sheet liabilities of the United States government now exceed $30 trillion or, or $22 trillion net of counterfeiting. I mean, the Fed balance sheet. But the off balance sheet liabilities are more scary. Uh, off balance sheet liabilities are $120 trillion. So if you add the net number, $22 trillion, uh, to the off balance sheet number of $140 trillion, uh, you have a circumstance where this debt is 
really, truly untenable. This isn't part of the speech being rich is glorious. What it is part of is the sense that society can exist without savings, that society can exist by eating its, feed cor its seed corn. And I would argue with most of you that the rich fulfill the function not just of creating social good as is evidence of their wealth, but also uh, as the source of capital to continue to grow. And we'll talk more about that uh, as we go on. I also, <laughs> you know, I, I was introduced as retired, as retired by the way. Uh, Bonnie will tell you I, I failed even considering retirement. Uh, I, I didn't retire. Uh, what I did was I made up my mind that I would, in work, uh, stop doing things that I didn't enjoy and that I wasn't good at. Why that didn't occur to me when I was much younger, by the way, is interesting. The freedom that comes as a consequence of not speaking and being regarded uh, as a spokesperson for Sprott, uh, as an example, means that I can talk about the next thing I'm going to talk about, which be, would be regarded in most circumstances as extremely elitist. And it might be elitist. But I want to talk to you about performance dispersal. Uh, I want to talk to you about Pareto's Law. How many people here are familiar with, the, with what Pareto's Law is? Almost all of you, that's great. Pareto, of course, the social scientist who put forth the sort of uh, social science narrative around the 80-20 rule, that 20% of a population generates 80% of the work or utility in any given sort of subject. What's interesting to me about Pareto's law, <laughs> and what used to get me in real hot water when I was regarded as a corporate spokesman, is of course this is a bell-shaped curve, first of all. I mean, the whole concept is elitist. The fact that 20% of a population generates 80% of the utility in any given task uh, is uncomfortable to the people who aren't on the good lip of this bell curve. The worst thing is that it is a bell curve. While 20% of the population generates 80% of the utility in any given task, another 20% of the population generates 80% of the aggravation, or as Walter would say, disutility. <laughs> so you have this bell-shaped curve, and you got a good 20 over here, and you got a bad 20 over here. So I learned fairly early on as an investor that what I wanted to do is I wanted to hang out in the good 20. You know, you got 20% of mining stock promoters that generate 80% of the utility, and you got 20% over here that only charitably would be described as the lame, the halt, and the blind. You know, they generated 80% of the losses over here. And then in the middle, you got what uh, they used to call the great unwashed. Now, the bad lip and the great unwashed hate the concept of a performance dispersal curve. What's more interesting about the Pareto's Law in the context of our discussion, and I think generally, is that if you take the result of that performance dispersal curve, you take this good lip and this bad lip, and you run it through the same performance dispersal curve, the statistics conformably align. Again, that's a fancy way of saying that 20% of the 20 generate 80% of the 80. And if the task is large enough, uh, that lip, the 4% lip, if you run it through the same performance dispersal curve, conformably aligns again, uh, which is to say, that a little less than 1% of the population, uh, I would argue, generates in excess of 40% of the utility in any given task. Statistical corroboration, look no, for, look no further than income and capital gains tax receipts in the United States. Uh, One-tenth of 1% 1 of American taxpayers pay 35% of the income and capital gains taxes paid in the United States. 1% of the taxpayers pay 40% uh, of the income and capital gains tax. Now, I'm not trying to suggest, by the way, that paying taxes is virtuous. I, I'm not trying to argue that in this group. I would argue, in fact, that it's treasonous, but uh, I'm a coward, so I'm a treason. I'm guilty of treason. What I'm suggesting is that this is a statistical corroboration of the fact that the performance dispersal curve conformably aligns uh, at least three times. And I'm not suggesting either that all of utility contributed to humankind is a consequence of the generation of material wealth. 
I am only suggesting that if you believe that savings are good, if you believe that uh, material innovation is good, if you believe that the ability to mobilize talent uh, and resources in the world to generate more economic utility is good, then there is a small subset of humankind, mostly rich, that do most of that material work. And the idea that you would vilify people uh, who have generated savings, who have generated utility, who have demonstrated the utility by, to humankind by aggregating payments that were made voluntarily to them to the rest of society, to the extent that you would argue that that's good in some fashion, uh, suggests to me that if you look through the whole sort of panoply of human activity, that you would, as an example, ban tall people or coordinated people from playing basketball that you would form a pygmy, pygmy league, uh, or perhaps that you would establish parity for paraplegics in hockey, uh, or something like that. It just, it, it's very difficult to square. I'm not suggesting that to be, rich is, you know, to be rich is virtuous. What I am suggesting simply is that the concept uh, of eating the rich would consign everybody who was temporarily sated, uh, even by eating a sort of <laughs> you know, well-marbled, uh, well-fed victim like myself to starvation uh, in the future. Markets are, uh, let me see if I get this right, markets are really truly amazing mechanisms by which people express inefficiently what they want. Uh, you cannot, maybe you can in the short term by lying, but you cannot uh, really generate a lot of material wealth if you don't satisfy a lot of needs. Markets are extremely creative. They are extremely good at creating wealth, at creating utility. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time arguing with you that governments are good. I would only suggest to you that the reason that governments exist are distributing wealth. Markets uh, if they are properly constituted, even informally, uh, are all about uh, convincing people. They are all about generating utility and convincing people as to the utility that you've created. Governments are different. They're coercive. And I would argue, and I think without fear of contradiction, probably, that uh, a market is by and of itself because the process is voluntary, because you determine for yourself what type of utility that you'd like to, cons to consume are good things. Uh, I would argue too, as uh, Mark Victor uh, argued, that the ultimate outcome of coercion is of course war. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I think there's this wonderful, wonderful sort of juxtaposition out there of values uh, between markets uh, and war. Uh, and I would continue to argue that the function that the rich fulfill is as society's seed corn uh, and as, in fact, the leading edge, uh, if you will, of the process of material creation and material dis distribution. I I'd like to give you, before we go into questions and answer, uh, a couple of examples uh, of what I'm talking about because we've talked about it at a very, very sort of high level. And, and I think it's useful to put this high level discussion uh, into context. One great example uh, was China, the PRC. I'm not suggesting that this, this place, like the United States, <laughs> is a paragon of virtue. What I am trying to say is that the transformation, the material transformation, uh, of China, I would argue, really stems importantly back to Deng Xiaoping saying, to be rich is glorious. The ethos that went on before that was the great leap forward, of course, where Mao led 20 million people uh, into starvation. To be rich is glorious was a very, very different idea. It wasn't about freedom, by the way. It was, however, about the fact that if you generated utility, you should get some of the utility that you generated. And the consequence of that was taking 450 million people 
uh, out of rural poverty and improving, if not anything else, substantially their material well-being. The example of Hong Kong has been pointed out. The example of the fact that Hong Kong, after World War II, experienced one of the greatest rates of economic growth, one of the greatest increases in material well-being in the history of humankind uh, before the ethos of to be rich is glorious. Uh, the juxtaposition of the material increases of wealth in Hong Kong with the dire poverty that we're seeing across the rest of the Yellow Basin, Yellow River Basin, pardon me, I think was ample testimony to the fact that the Communist Party's uh, suggestion that Chinese people eat the rich uh, reaped for them the consequences that I'm talking about in this speech. That's not the only place that we've seen examples of this. I, I would suggest that some of the roots of anti-Semitism uh, around the world have been due to the fact that the Jews, for various reasons, to their benefit, by the way, were consigned to financial services <laughs> and, as a consequence, of, uh, became, uh, in many places, very rich, uh, became the financiers of industry, became maybe not so gloriously, the financiers of government. But I would suggest that the roots of anti-Semitism in many parts of the world didn't have as much to do with um, Jewish culture or Jewish language as the fact that people who had been less successful than the Jews became very envious. And I think if you look at the history of anti-Semitism around the world, separate and apart from the fact that it was wrong, it was self-destructive. <laughs> the idea that the uh, Rothschilds, as an example, uh, were great destroyers of humankind, uh, ignores the incredible, incredible contributions of the Rothschilds as an example to world trade uh, and to the uh, well-being, the material well-being of humankind. Uh, a better local example, I think, in Vancouver uh, has been the Ismaili Muslim diaspora. Some of you may be aware that uh, Many, many, many Indi uh, it, people of Indian descent, uh, particularly Gujarati Muslims, Ismaili Muslims, uh, moved from India at the suggestion of the Aga Khan and others uh, and settled in places like Uganda. And one consequence of that, uh, I would suggest a consequence of uh, tribal trust, really, is that the Ismaili Muslims became easily the most successful business people in East Africa. And their reward for bringing relative prosperity to Uganda was the fact that they were roundly resented by the people to whom they had brought prosperity to. Idi Amin, of course, became very popular by saying Africa for Africans through the Ismaili Muslims uh, out of Uganda. As my friend from Vancouver, Nash Jiwa, said, thankfully threw us out of Uganda, otherwise we'd still be there. But the, uh, the upshot of this discussion is that it is estimated that the wealth and economic contribution of the descendants of the 28,000 Ismaili Muslims who immigrated to Canada exceeds the GDP of Uganda today. The diaspora of the 28,000 people who left Uganda generates more utility than the whole of the country that they left. Uh, Uganda, of course, famously, ate their rich and, as a consequence, literally, were starving. <laughs> a personal example for myself, and I, I, I never now miss the opportunity to castigate the provincial legislature in British Columbia uh, or Vancouver City Council. In my own personal circumstance, my wife and I have been uh, involved uh, enjoying Vancouver <laughs> They got me. Uh, participating, can you hear me? Yeah. No. Okay. Participating in the BC economy. Uh, and, sorry. It stopped working. Stop working? It's all good. All good, says so the giant. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I would suggest that the BC provincial legislature and the city council here decided to eat the rich. Now, actually, I was collateral damage. They didn't mean to vilify a white American guy. What they meant to be was xenophobic and racist. Uh, many Caucasian Canadians have said, well, we made a mistake. This wasn't supposed to apply to you. It was supposed to apply to crazy rich Asians. 
Uh, in other words, in addition to being envious, they were racist too. But let's look at the action and let's look at the outcome. In my particular case, Bonnie and I were good participants in the Canadian economy. We helped start a lot of companies in this town. We generated a lot of employment. And unfortunately, we paid a hell of a lot of tax, same amount of tax that you are. And we were really good customers. I mean, we were really good customers. We owned a nice piece of property here. But we didn't demand any services. We didn't send any kids to school. I mean, I'm obviously at 70, 69 years of age. I'm not much of a police threat. Uh, you know, we were hardly here at all, which meant that while we paid all the tax, we didn't consume any services. You know, I was brought up in business. If you have a big customer and you have a high margin on that customer, that customer's God. And I think I should have been treated as God. Uh, the truth is, that isn't what occurred. Because I was an evil foreigner, uh, because I lived in a nice part of town, I lived in a nice place, the Vancouver City Council decided that I was a speculator. And the BC provincial, oh, it's the other way around? Okay, the BC provincial legislature decided I was a speculator. And I forget what Vancouver City Council decided I was, but they decided I wasn't something good. And the consequence of that is that my property tax went from 60 basis points, which is to say six tenths of 1%, to 560 basis points. Yeah, it was, it was pretty unpleasant. Now, you know, they explained it away to me by saying, well, it isn't really you what we were after. We were after those damn Chinese. Um, as I say, they were, in addition to being thieves, they were racists, too. The, and by the way, uh, now, uh, as a consequence of COVID, where we couldn't come across the border, rather than giving us a holiday from this tax, <laughs> they tripled it. Uh, now, uh, somebody in my position would pay 7% of the assessed value of their property every year in tax. Um, while obviously this impacts more, me, more than it impacts you, you have to think about the outcome of this. First of all, anytime I'm in a foreign jurisdiction and people ask me about investing in Canada, I say only as a last resort. They used to regard you as a milk cow. Now they regard you as a beef cow. They can and they will eat you at their opportunity, particularly in Vancouver. But two, uh, I myself uh, am involved in the BC economy less and less and less. I've learned through 45 years of being a foreign investor that when the local population decides that they don't want you, you're well advised <laughs> to listen. Uh, and, and the consequence of that in my own circumstance is whatever contributions I might be able to make to the Vancouver and the BC economy in the years going forward. If I do it, it will only be, be because the opportunity that's offered up to me is so much greater than the risk that I have already experienced <laughs> that it will uh, sort of overcome that. The last thing I'd like to say in the defense of private wealth uh, and the fact that the rich are, in fact, the seed corn for society, is I believe that a diversity of opinion, uh, a market, if you will, both in terms of the generation of utility, but also in the dispersal of utility, is very useful. Uh, it turns out that rich people, at least in my experience, have been pretty broadly philanthropic. What's nice, I think, uh, about rich people being philanthropic is that they all have different outlooks and they all have different interests. I was at a banquet the other night inducting a good friend of mine, uh, Robert Friedland, into sort of the panoply of gods Bob of the mining Porter. business. Bob Porterman, I'm sorry, Bob Porterman, got, got the wrong Bob. And one of the things that I was struck with uh, was when they were talking about the various inductees to the Canadian Hall of Fame, Mining Hall of Fame, all of the philanthropies uh, that the people who were being inducted were uh, representative of. And what struck me is that the five or six inductees were probably involved in a hundred different philanthropic activities. I'm not defending the philanthropy. What I'm trying to say is I would like wealth redistributed to society, A, by the people who generated it, and B, I would like a market in philanthropy. The fact that uh, Ross Beatty is active in environmental concerns, spending his own money, being responsible for his own outcome. The fact that uh, Robert Quartermain is involved in gay, lesbian uh, activities, spending his own money. 
the fact that these inductees were not just philanthropically inclined, but were philanthropically inclined across a broad variety of outcomes and importantly involved in those outcomes, not as third party participants, I think in my own mind makes society much richer and much more durable. So I will leave you this. First of all, I would love to see Tinkerbell rewarded by being rich. And if that occurs, please don't be envious. Think of her as everyone else's social safety net. Think of her as society's seed corn. Eat her at your peril. Thank you. Sure, I was just going to follow up from Lubika's talk. I was going to kind of draw a parallel because she talked about monolithic versus um, right. modular systems. Mm -hmm. And in a socialist system, you need you need central planners to decide how to allocate the capital resources. So if you just thought, hey, why don't we give the central planners who generate the best, you know, who are the best at planning and best at predicting the future, just give them a greater and greater say in which in resource allocation, then that, that seems like a pretty good idea. And, <laughs> and that eventually basically leads to exactly what you're talking about. Right. Where, you know, the people who generate the best returns. So like most rich people I know don't, consume many resources, usually they're just, their wealth is shares of the company that they've created or something like that. And so it's a, you know, I'm very happy. I like living in a prosperous society. So it's nice to have these people basically working night and day to create that for everyone else. The downside of that, of course, is that rich people are often very determined and very pragmatic. And they are perfectly willing to use the government to coerce you yeah. to buy their goods and services. Don't, <laughs> don't assign us too much virtue. I'm just going to ask you a personal question. Yes, sir. Do you still own the condo here? Or you still Do I still own the condo here? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, Mickey. When when a society tells me they don't want me, long gone. <clears throat> Thank you, Rick. Um, an orthogonal question in terms of rich, we define recalibrate in terms of dollars or what is money. What is your perspective on the future nature of money and is going to evolve between uh, fiat currency or cryptocurrency, which is a whole mess to get into, or are we going to go to something further? And is there a basis for evaluating currency on seniorage and what it costs to create a currency? And I would ask the basis of that seniorage to be energy, as in terawatt hours. Weird question. The, the gentleman asked a very good question about the nature of money and the future of money with technology. Uh, and I want to say, first of all, I've thought a lot about it, and, and that isn't what I do. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm a lender. Uh, I put out currency, and I hopefully get back more than I put out. I'm a consumer of currencies, though. I want to say that. Uh, and the idea that there are 50 or 60 fiat currencies and technology-based currencies, all of which are trying to develop more utility for me, I think is a very good thing. <laughs> uh, so I'm ducking the question, uh, I guess. My, my hope is that going forward there will be lots of competing currencies. And each of these currencies will be trying to develop more utility for me as a consumer so that to the extent that it's convenient for me to denominate part of my savings in an energy-backed security uh, uh, currency, that's great to the extent that my fear overwhelms my greed and I want part of my wealth stored in gold, that's great too. I, I, I'm not meaning to duck the question, I'm just not competent to answer it. Yeah, I'm going to just follow up on your idea of the rich as a savings bank in the context of, like, say, oh, one huge currency like the dollar, right? Um, I remember reading once that you know, Andrew Carnegie or somebody like that could run the U.S. government for like a few months, uh, just on his money, but Bill Gates, and this was like a maybe 20 years ago, could do it for like a day or something right. like that. Given all the trillions that were just spent, <laughs> unless the you know rich, you know, their wealth goes up in line with all the money that's kind of out there now, and I may not understand anything, but this is at least the perception I have, is that their ability to then be that savings bank has effectively shrunk. And would it, it has it, and would that be would it be dangerously so uh, if we already at this level of spending or if this continues if this continues. I think that's a very good point. Um, to the extent that people did, did eat the rich, it would be just one banquet. 
uh, <laughs> we would not be uh, a sort of a sustainable grocery store. The Last Supper. For anybody, <laughs> yeah, The Last Supper. <laughs> hey, uh, Rick, you said that um, when a society tells me, you know, they don't want me anymore or whatever, I'm gone. Gone to where? I mean, there's no Galt's Gulch that I'm no. aware of. And then the second part of the question, where do you put your wealth today to keep it so it's not eaten, if you will? Uh, those are great questions. I hope everybody heard them. Uh, Bonnie and I have uh, fleed successively Canada and California, both. Uh, and my suspicion is that we have enough accumulated wealth that even as the United States and Washington State itself becomes more draconian, that somehow we'll get through. But your question is a good one. Uh, in both regards, uh, with regards to wealth stored in U.S. dollars or, or wealth stored in normal conventional financial instruments, the first thing that you have to do for your self-protection is generate enough that you can afford a substantial amount of it to be stolen from the state. Uh, and with regards to political alternatives, uh, increasingly there are none that I care to live in at present. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm willing to let them steal a fair bit if they, <laughs> if they just leave me alone as much as I can experience, but that's personal. Hello, uh, my name is Peter Bell. Thanks very much for the speech. I went through a transcript of uh, your one from 10 years ago and a lot of similar themes, really interesting. A simple question, that left edge of the curve, is there anything we can do to kind of nurture it, expand it, increase it? How do we get more rich people? Uh, Peter, thank you, by the way. I saw your post on LinkedIn, and I connected to that speech, and frankly, I'd forgotten that I gave it. Uh, it was pretty good, I have to say. So <laughs> thank you for reminding me of work I did earlier in my career that I'd completely forgotten about. Um, I'm, in terms of nurturing that part of the bell curve, I remember a talk that Ayn Rand gave in New Orleans, which I wasn't present for, but I heard a recording, and they asked her the opposite question. What of the poor? And she said, well, first, don't become them. Don't become one of them. They don't need competition. <laughs> they don't need you to help them by joining them. Uh, I would suggest that the pursuit of material wealth as opposed to material well-being is not for everybody. Uh, there are large aspects of your life that you sacrifice as a consequence of pursuing material wealth. So it isn't for everybody. And I'm not, I, I have never suggested that, uh, you know, wealth is necessarily virtuous. To the extent that you want to pursue it, I think that's a wonderful thing because I do believe in most cases, not all cases, Material wealth is evidence of a contribution to society. I think what you can do to nurture it is just get out of the way. Just allow people to be themselves and do what they want to do. Uh, when, you know, I got to give uh, Bonnie, my wife, credit. In, I believe it was 1990, I measured myself in terms of material outcomes. I'd been through a period where <laughs> I lost more than 100% of my own personal wealth. And I was trying to get rich again. And Bonnie said to me, uh, stop trying to make money. Start doing things that you love so much. And I'm paraphrasing, she didn't say it like this. Start doing things that you love so much that other people can't compete with you. And worry about generating outcomes for your customers who will take care of you. And literally, uh, I would say within half a year of stopping worrying about making money, <laughs> I was making a ton of money uh, because I focused on the process of making money. I focused on generating utility rather than on making the money. My customers didn't care if I get rich. I mean, they didn't hold it against me, but what my customers were interested in what I was, was what I was going to do for them. So I would suspect that to the extent that more people focused on improving other people's material outcomes, that their own outcome would be substantially better. Quick question, when we talk of the bell curve, I use the bell as an acronym for back end liquidity liability. I've got another maybe 10 or 15 years and I'm storing surplus to convert in the future, the back end, right. to being providing uh, food, shelter, clothing, energy. What mix do you see in 10 to 15 years that provides that liquidity of getting whatever you've stored back 
to convert into those things you need to sustain your life? Uh, I, I thought a lot about that, and I don't have an answer. Uh, what I have learned, you know, Warren Buffett once said that uh, trying to understand a market, a future market, involves so many variables that what you are trying to do is, quote, know the unknowable. Uh, given that Buffett can't do it, for sure, Rule can't do it. So I have focused on making enough in the now that I can afford some mistakes between now and then. Uh, I've focused on developing knowledge that was unique to me and of benefit to others. I haven't tried to be all things to all people, but I've tried to understand what I do so deeply that it's very difficult for other people to compete. And in terms of my savings, it's a cop-out, but I've come to believe in diversification. Uh, I know I'm going to screw something up, and I don't, I'm not smart enough to have all my eggs in one basket for fear that somebody's going to step on that basket for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne.